In the quiet gypsum dunes of southern New Mexico, the earth remembers what history forgot. There, in the dried bed of ancient Lake Otero, are footprints, human footprints, walking across the clay thousands of years before any textbooks allowed. They belong to children and adults, hunters and foragers, moving across the muddy lakeshore among the mammoths and giant sloths. A woman was carrying a toddler, then the toddler walked next to her, then her footprints disappear. Radiocarbon dating of plant seeds above and below these prints places them at 21,000 to 23,000 years ago. But you already know this story. So now we ask, who was the White Sands woman? Who were her people? Where did they come from? And why did they vanish so completely that they left no bones, no tools, only footprints in the sand? The answer may lie hundreds of miles away, not in the high deserts of New Mexico, but on the Pacific coast in Baja, California. There, in caves and coastal cliffs, lived the Pericu people, who seemed out of time, their features echoing a world older than even the first Americans. And further south, near the ancient lakes of the Valley of Mexico, the skull of a woman who lived over 12,000 years ago was found resting in volcanic sediments her features startlingly unlike those of later Native Americans and more like ancient Japanese or Melanesians. The White Sands footprints appear in the most unexpected place, not along a coast, but deep within the continental interior. Yet the path from Baja to White Sands was not as inhospitable as it seems. Lake Otero in the Tularosa Basin was one of several massive Ice Age lakes that formed across the southwest. It was an oasis teeming with megafauna. Mammoths, giant ground sloths, camelids, and bordered by wetlands, grasses, and freshwater pools. The footprints preserved in the gypsum reveal more than just presence. They tell a story. They show children walking alongside adults. They show people moving across soft clay, their feet pressing into the earth as mammoths passed in the other direction. Some of the sloths appear to have twisted in alarm, reacting to the human approach. It is a living moment captured not in bones or tools, but in motion. Yet there are no fire pits, no stone tools, no bones. It is as though the group came and went like wind across the dunes, leaving only their shadows behind. That these tracks are so old, dating back to around 23,000 years ago, suggests the people of White Sands arrived long before any Clovis hunters could have reached the region through an ice-free corridor. And this raises a profound question. Where did they come from, and how did they get to this location, far from the ocean and major rivers? This is not the story of the Beringland Bridge. It is the story of an earlier people, a maritime people, who may have arrived on the continent not 15,000, but 28,000 years ago, before the last glacial maximum reshaped the world. A people who may have entered through the Gulf of California, followed rivers north, and left behind only whispers in the sand. To reach White Sands from the Pacific coast, a group of people would have most likely moved northeast from the Gulf of California. The journey would not have taken them across the dry Sonoran interior, but instead along a corridor of water and wetlands that wound through the southwestern United States. The ancient Colorado River, fed by glacial melt and seasonal rains, poured into a vast delta at the head of the Gulf. This delta would have been a thriving estuary with fish, birds, and plant life. From here, the explorers could have followed the Colorado River upstream, entering the Gila River Valley in what is now Arizona. During the last glacial maximum, the Gila River and its tributaries were wetter and more dependable than they are today, supporting stands of cottonwood, mesquite, and willows. From the Gila River, explorers could have followed tributaries and low passes into southern New Mexico. Along the way, they would have encountered Playa Lakes, ephemeral bodies of water filled by winter rains and snowmelt, as well as freshwater springs and marshes. The region was more temperate and biologically productive than it is today, allowing for slow, seasonal migration. The final leg of the journey would bring them to the eastern edge of the Tularosa Basin, where Lake Otero spread out in a vast, shimmering plain. The total journey from the Colorado Delta to White Sands was about only 600 miles or so, entirely feasible over the course of several months or a few seasons. 
These were not aimless wanderers. They followed rivers like roads. They walked with knowledge, purpose, and memory. They may have made the footprints on purpose, knowing they were the only humans to walk that part of the planet and to see animals that no human had seen before. Animals that had no fear of humans. New archaeological findings and subtle genetic traces suggest that humans arrived in the Americas far earlier than previously accepted. The most conservative estimates point to around 20,000 years ago. But signs of even earlier settlement, possibly as far back as 28,000 years, are beginning to emerge, especially in South America and along submerged coastlines that would have been exposed during the Ice Age. These colonizers did not walk through an ice-free corridor between glacial walls. Instead, they came by sea, hugging the Pacific coastline from Southeast Asia, following the Kelp Highway, navigating island chains with hollowed log canoes made of spruce or redwood. These people were the maritime children of Southeast Asia, seafarers by birth, who had already crossed between islands in Indonesia and Japan tens of thousands of years before reaching the New World. Fish hooks made of shell dating to 42,000, 23,000 and 12,000 years old have been found in Indonesia, Japan and Baja, respectively, giving a tantalizing glimpse of a possible 30,000-year migration route. People were fishing the deep sea off of Indonesia 50,000 years ago and arrived in Japan 35,000 years ago and could have made the migration along the Beringia coast to North America by 30,000 years ago. A brief warm period from 33,000 to 30,000 years ago could have been their window, with temperatures dropping around 28,000 years ago. This fits with a timeline for humans arriving in North America 26,000 years ago. As the last glacial maximum approached, sea levels dropped dramatically, exposing new shorelines and expanding estuarine environments. The Gulf of California transformed into a vast, shallow inland sea filled with marine resources, ideal for skilled foragers with a deep-time knowledge of the coast. It was here, on the Baja Peninsula, that the first Americans may have found safe harbor and their first homeland. Far from being an arid outpost, Baja California during the Ice Age was a place of abundance. Its coasts were lined with kelp beds, tidal flats, and estuaries. Inland oases and mountain springs offered fresh water. Fog-fed pine forests crowned the highlands. This narrow land, hemmed in by desert and sea, may have served as a refugium for some of the first people to set foot in North America. What's more, around 9,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, the region around Baja rapidly dried out and the sea levels rose. So if there was a large population around Baja, they would have been forced to migrate. This also aligns with the idea that Baja and the Gulf of California was a major population center during the Ice Age. This makes sense, because even today the ocean is teeming with fish and the land would have been a green paradise during the wet times of the Ice Age. Intriguingly, geneticists found a ghost population that mixed with Mesoamericans around 8,700 years ago and then migrated south into Central and South America. The study suggests that this group came from Baja and moved rapidly and were a seafaring culture. Indeed, genetic researchers found an Austronesian genetic signal in Amazonian groups that have been isolated for over 10,000 years. Among the most mysterious of Baja's inhabitants were the Pericu, an indigenous people who survived in southern Baja until the arrival of the Spanish in the 18th century. They fished with hooks and nets, lived in caves, used wooden watercraft, and practiced maritime hunting of sea turtles and shellfish. Their bodies, however, did not resemble those of their neighbors. Pericu skulls were dolichocephalic, long-headed and narrow-faced, more akin to early Southeast Asians or the Aboriginal peoples of Australo-Melanesia than to the later wave of Native Americans from Siberia. Anthropologists puzzled over this. Was it coincidence? Was it isolation? Or was it a living remnant of a much older wave of migration? If the Pericu were indeed descendants of the first maritime settlers in Baja, they were the last flickering trace of a population that once ranged far wider. Baja may not have been their final destination. It may have been their cradle. From its coves and inlets, they could move inland along rivers, into the great interior basins of the continent. 
While the Pericou lingered in coastal isolation, another clue to the first Americans lies inland, buried beneath ancient volcanic sediments in the heart of the Valley of Mexico. Peñon Woman, discovered near Mexico City, was unearthed from lake bed layers near the former Lake Texcoco. Radiocarbon dating places her remains at approximately 12,700 years ago, but what truly sets her apart is her cranial morphology. Her skull is long and narrow, with delicate facial bones and a gracile structure that differs significantly from later Native American populations. These features resemble the Australo-Melanesian pattern seen in early Southeast Asian populations, and they closely match the morphology of the Pericu and the skulls of Lagoa Santa in Brazil. Peñon Woman appears to be another remnant of the first coastal migration wave, a descendant of the same group that once passed through Baja and inland river corridors. Her burial beside an extinct lake in a high-altitude basin once rich in water and wildlife suggests that her people followed a pattern similar to the White Sands people. They settled near lakes, rivers, and springs, preferring the edges of water in a continent that, though colder, was not yet desert. The similarities in both anatomy and ecology between Penyon Woman and the White Sands people add weight to the theory that they shared common ancestors, early explorers who had spread widely through the Americas before the last glacial maximum fully closed the northern routes. The Spirit Cave Man and Wizard's Beach Man of Nevada, both dating to around 10,000 years, may have carried some of her ancestry. If Penyon Woman and the White Sands group represent inland branches of this ancient population, the Pericu of Baja California were its last coastal survivors. Described by early Spanish missionaries as unusual in both appearance and behavior, the Pericu fished using hooks made of shell and bone, they hunted sea turtles and marine mammals using wooden clubs and spears. Most remarkably, they used plank-built canoes called balsas, which they stitched together with fibre and sealed with natural tar. These canoes were unlike anything found among neighbouring indigenous groups in mainland Mexico, and far more like the maritime traditions of the Pacific Islands and coastal Southeast Asia. The Pericu also practiced complex mortuary rituals, burying their dead in caves or within shell middens, sometimes with grave goods. They made rock art, and the women went naked, wearing only tribal tattoos and body art, just as the White Sands woman may have done 22,000 years ago. If these early Americans spread from Baja to White Sands and beyond, then they must have once spoken languages a web of dialects evolving over time as small groups diverged, travelled and resettled. But none of those languages survived into the ethnographic record. Their language was quite distinct and was said to sound like the chirping of parakeets, which is where their Spanish tribal name comes from, but no full translation survives. Spanish colonists found it impossible to connect their dialect to any known group on the mainland. Linguistically, as well as anatomically, they were isolated. They may have been speaking the final version of a language that had been spoken in Baja for 20,000 years, the last echoes of the original maritime migration into the New World. With their extinction, the last living window into the Ice Age Baja homeland closed forever, but their skulls remain silent witnesses to an ancient ancestry, preserved in museums and cave tombs, waiting to be recognized for what they might be. Survivors of the First Wave The absence of a surviving First Wave language today mirrors the absence of their genetics in most modern native populations. What remains are fragments, bone shapes, footprints, forgotten dialects, tool traditions, scattered across the continent like embers from a dying fire. How did such a widespread and early population vanish? The answer lies partly in numbers. The First Wave of Native Americans was likely small, perhaps a few hundred individuals at most, scattered across vast landscapes, slowly expanding into new niches. They thrived in coastal and riverine environments, but remained isolated, especially as the last glacial maximum set in between 25,000 and 15,000 years ago. Their populations may have grown slowly, constrained by limited resources or by the fragility of small founding groups. Then came the second wave of Native Americans. As the ice sheets began to melt around 16,000 years ago, people from Beringia, 
with stronger genetic links to Siberian and East Asian populations, began moving south through Canada and into the American interior. They brought new technologies, like Clovis points, and more advanced hunting strategies. Their numbers were larger. Their populations rapidly expanded. The newcomers did not necessarily kill off the first wave, but they may have absorbed, displaced, or outcompeted them. The early coastal peoples may have retreated to lands like Baja, while others were absorbed through interbreeding. Over time, their distinctive genes, languages, and cultural practices were overwritten by the faster-growing populations that followed. By the time of Penyon Woman 12,700 years ago, her people were already rare. By the time the Pericu met the Spanish, they were surrounded by strangers, their homeland a cultural island. And by the time archaeologists found the footprints at White Sands, their memory had vanished. The people who left their footprints at White Sands are the ghosts of a forgotten migration. They were not ancient Siberians. They did not arrive across an ice-free corridor. They came by sea, arriving not by land, but by sea. In Baja and on the continental shelf of California and Oregon, in the fog-fed forests and fish-rich estuaries, they built boats, raised families, and set out on journeys into the interior. Some moved inland, along the Colorado and Gila rivers, following a ribbon of lakes and springs, until they reached the great basin of Lake Otero. Others moved south, settling in ancient Mexico City, or continuing even further into the Amazon basin. Still others remained behind in Baja, fishing and burying their dead in coastal caves, until they too were erased by time. They spoke languages now lost. They carried genes now diluted, but they walked with purpose and left behind signs, a footprint in the mud, a skull in the lake bed, a canoe design carved from memory. The White Sands people may be gone, but they were real. They were the first wave, and their memory still lingers in the land. To reconstruct their story is to reclaim a forgotten chapter in the human saga, a chapter written not in stone tools or towering monuments, but in footprints and the enduring resilience of those who dared to walk first.